Thanks. Just before our love got lost, you said I am as constant as the northern star And I said, constantly in the darkness Where's that at? If you want me, I'll be in the bar On the back of a cartoon coaster in the blue TV screen light I drew a map of Canada Oh Canada oh. With your face sketched on it twice You're in my blood, my holy wine You taste so bitter and so sweet, oh, I can drink a case of you, ooh, darling. And I would still be on my feet, I would still be on my feet. I'm a lonely painter I live in a box of pains I'm frightened by the devil But I'm drawn to those ones that ain't afraid I remember that time you told me You said love is touching souls Surely you touch mine Cause part of you flows out of me In these lines from time to time Whoa, but you're in my blood, my holy wine You taste so bitter and so sweet Oh, I could drink a case of you And I would still be on my feet Would still be on my feet I met a woman She had a mouth like yours she knew your life, knew your devil and your deeds And she said, go to him, stay with him if you can But be prepared to bleed Oh, but you're in my blood, my holy wine You taste so bitter, baby, bitter and so sweet Oh, I could drink a case of you Ooh, darling And I would still be on my feet I would still be on my feet So this work is going to serve as a kind of placeholder
for one of the works that is in the ex exhibition across the hall. As I understand it, none of you have seen, has seen the, uh, the exhibition yet. But um, this is <clears throat> a work that I made in 1980, a phonograph record, uh, the point of departure of which is um, um, a recording by Glenn Gould of the complete solo piano music of um, Arnold Schoenberg. And then in the early 90s, I uh, actually, in 1984, I first designed a display system for this record because in 1980, when I made the record, I was only thinking about it as being a record. And then in 1984, I was asked to participate in the first exhibition I had made in Europe, in Belgium, in Ghent. And uh, at that moment, I kind of stepped back from this project I had made and decided that I was going to focus upon the display system that would present the record as part of an exhibition. But I'm not really going to talk about this work. <clears throat> because Arnold Schoenberg um, returns as a figure in one of the works in the exhibition. The title of which is To the People of Frankfurt am Main, Former Site of Reconstructed Schoenberg Study, Arnold Schoenberg Institute, Room 201, University of Southern California, Los Angeles, reconstructed at Schoenberg Center, Vienna, in the year 2000. <clears throat> I like to um, begin my presentations with the statement that an artwork cannot be reduced to the ideas that generate it, even though many times um, I'm um, nominated as a conceptual artist, I don't privilege the sight of idea over action or inaction or um, fragmentation or a variety of other ways that we can spatialize our thoughts. Um, but on another level, the, this forum that we're entertaining tonight, that we're participating in, is a luxury. I mean, this is a, a public forum. I'm here. I can say certain things that perhaps are not immediately elucidated in the work, or maybe they're veiled, or they're submerged, or they're stratified. Um, because oftentimes, what I try to do in my work is to give form to forms that I witness in the world. And every object that I confront is, um, e even if it has a very uh, simple and cohesive surface, even if it presents itself um, with a gestalt, um, I think that there's always a sedimentary aspect to every object. And so I'm interested in that, um, trying to give form to that. <clears throat> so. I'm also suspicious of um, anecdotes being used as a stand-in for history. I mean, at the same time, I acknowledge that all history um, is constituted in some part through anecdote or with anecdote. Uh, so I am going to recount um, an anecdote uh, to elucidate this work that I'm showing here at the Bergen Kunsthalle. Um, when I had moved to Los Angeles in the late 70s to go to graduate school. Um, I was uh, studying visual art, but I was also very interested in uh, music and performance. And so I went to a lot of concerts. And one day I went to the University of Southern California to go to the Arnold Schoenberg Institute. And the Institute is one of those typical mid-20th century modern buildings, brute, cast concrete, I think you know the style. I think you have a few of them in Bergen. Um, and it was asymmetrical, like a big ramp leads up to the entrance. And so it meant to embody uh, the, the, the ethos of 20th century modernism, at least one variant of it. <clears throat> but upon entering the foyer, there was a large picture window through which one would look. And there was a reconstruction of Arnold Schoenberg's st uh, uh, study when he lived in Brentwood, California. Um, ironically, or maybe not so ironically, across the street from where O.J. Simpson would come to reside later in both of their careers. Um, but one thing that always struck me about this, it was kind of like the shock of recognition that once one would peer into this picture window, um, we were not looking at mid-20th uh, century modernism. We were looking at 1920s Spanish colonial 
um, architecture because that's the kind of house that Schoenberg lived in. And you didn't see Bertoia chairs or Ames chairs or, or Alvar Alto. You saw all of this kind of mismatched, heavy, dark furniture, uh, um, uh, an upright piano. Uh, Schoenberg was also very interested in making his own uh, playing cards from scratch, or he made his own dice pieces, um, uh, different kinds of games, and then also displayed were, um, in, a, in a fully fetishistic manner, and that's not a criticism, it's a criticism, it's just a description, were all of the implements that Schoenberg had developed to write, to, to write his musical scores. And so I was always struck by the, this discontinuity that this disjunct that happens between this overall framing device of architecture and then this um, window onto a world of another kind of architecture. And so that stuck with me. Um, again, I think I first saw that in the late 70s, and then I didn't make this artwork until 2000, and I'm kind of a pokey artist, so it takes me a while to get around to things or to figure things out. But by the time I had figured something out or thought that I had figured something out or deluded myself to the point where I thought I had figured something out, um, the Schoenberg family, I mean, Schoenberg had long been dead. I mean, he was dead before the Institute was founded. Um, uh, the Schoenberg family had had a falling out with the University of Southern California. They had removed the archives of, of Schoenberg, and they had, uh, and now they reside in the city of Vienna, Austria, in the newly instituted Arnold Schoenberg Institute or Inst um, Arnold Schoenberg Center. Uh, but the building still stands, and it still says Arnold Schoenberg Institute across it. But the room that used to house this replication of his studio. Um, is now the office for the woman who manages all the symphony orchestras on, um, on campus. And so I needed to contact her and somehow convince her that it was okay for me to make a meeting with her and then get on my hands and knees and measure the dimensions of this room, knowing full well that this was not the original study of Schoenberg, which still exists, that a house still exists in Brentwood, but I was much more interested in this attempt to replicate it in a different style of architecture. And so the room that has been built uh, for this exhibition here uh, replicates exactly the interior dimensions of that room that is now the office of the symphony manager. <clears throat> This is an installation view from, I never saw this exhibition actually, but it was in New York, I think it was in 1990. It was at um, a place called Home Theater and Gallery. And uh, Colin DeLand, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Colin DeLand, but he was a, um, an empresario gallerist in New York in the, um, in the 80s and 90s. Um, unfortunately, Colin has died of cancer now, but um, he had the, the um, gallery American Fine Arts. And he was the curator for this exhibition. And so it brings together the work of Daniel Buren, Ken Lum, Rudy Stengel, Rudolf Stengel, maybe I should be more formal, and my work. And so um, the red and white striped wallpaper is Buren's work. Um, I don't know if you can tell from this projection, but on the left-hand wall, uh, that's also been wallpapered, but the red and white stripe paper has been installed in reverse, so the red is against the wall and you only see the red through. Um, the furniture was rented from one of those, you know, office um, furniture rental agencies uh, by Ken Lum and arranged in, in this configuration. So it's the four sofas and the four end tables and the four lamps arranged in such a way that it does not allow entrance into the middle and so they cannot be used. You cannot sit on the sofas. The orange carpeting is Rudy Stengel's work. And my work um, would be the, the, the framed objects where you really don't see very much information here, but I wanted to show this image because I'm very interested in this kind of application of my work, um, where I can make a work that is at least relatively autonomous, but I'm very interested when it enters into uh, a variety of different gallery display situations. And so when Colin um, approached me to 
uh, participate in the show and he told me that my work would be hanging on top of Daniel Buren wallpaper, I said, fine, let's, let's give it a shot. Because I think of my work as not becoming meaningful, if it ever does become meaningful, until it's received by an audience. And again, that betrays the fact that I have been damaged by Duchamp, who said that an artwork is not finished until it meets a spectator. Um, One thing I can say about this also in terms of the anecdotal, uh, these works of mine that are being shown, there are three examples from this ongoing series. Um, the, the overall umbrella term for the series is Exquisite Corpse, the Complete Paintings of Manet. And it's a, um, an ongoing series that I started um, on January 1st, 1988. And I'm still in the process of making this procession of 556 diptychs. And I believe that I have made 211 of them so far. Um, just to name drop a little bit, I was at a, a pool party in Los Angeles in the early 90s and Martin Kippenberger was there. And he asked me, well, what are you up to these days? I said, well, I'm preparing an exhibition of you know, new works from this exquisite corpse series, which he had seen in London. And he looked at me incredulously and he said, you're still working on those? I said, uh-huh. He goes, why don't you just hire 15 assistants and make them all in a weekend? And I said, because you are a very different kind of artist than I am, Martin. Because I deployed this um, project with the intention of making it a very long, ongoing project. And for, um, for instance, there are certain times when I'm very active in making these works, and there are certain times when I am inactive. I can go a couple of years uh, without making one. I'm making um, three new ones for an exhibition I will make in Boston at the Barbara Krakow Gallery in April. I mean, I may not finish the series before I die. Tragic. <laughs> but one aspect of this work is that um, it is a series of diptychs. Uh, the left hand, um, and here it's kind of re-spatialized, it's a little bit too difficult to explain what's going on in this slide, but in the exhibition you will see three diptychs from this series, and the left-hand panel is a unique drawing of uh, diluted India uh, uh, sepia ink um, applied with a natural sea sponge onto rag barrier paper. And each drawing is exactly the same size as a painting that Manet had made. And it is paired with a poster, an index, which represents to scale um, all of the formats that Manet made um, in his entire career. And it's thought that he, it, that he made 556 paintings in his career. When I say it is thought that he made 556, the Bible that I use for this project is a Penguin paperback catalogue raisonné of Manet. I like to think of it as the pulp fiction version of the catalogue raisonné, because at the time there had been what we think of as being the definitive authoritative volume. But I was more interested in the one that I could afford, the one that was in my library, which is actually a kind of rough and ready um, forced compilation of about five or six different catalogue raisonnés, and they don't agree with one another. So there are certain works that are disputed. Um, and I mentioned that Colin Deland was the curator of this exhibition, and he had made a studio visit with me, I think in 1987, so I had been working on this project for a while, gearing up for January 1st, 1988, so I could execute the first examples of it. And I told him that I was using this book, and I explained, and he looked at this book, and, um, and I told him that I'm going to be making these in chronological order rigorously. And, and then he asked me, well, what happens if there's an error in the book? How am I going to verify if there are errors, and how would I correct those? And I said, I'm not going to correct them. I'm not even going to attempt to verify them. I'm, this is not so much about going back to the original paintings of Manet, but using this intermediary source that is presenting itself as at least somewhat authoritative. And so I, I mentioned that if there are errors in the book, then I will replicate them. And he looked a little stunned, and then I mentioned, um, this work is about representation, not about truth. And then it kind of clicked, and he said, okay, now I understand what's going on here. So for instance, this um, 
Catalogue Raisonné was published in 1969, and it uh, attempts to indicate where all of the works were located at the time. Well, many of the Manet works are no longer in those collections if they were in a private collection. For instance, there, there's a, a work that was in a private collection in New York, and now that work has been donated to the National Gallery in Washington. But again, I don't correct any of that information. I replicate the 1969 understanding of Manet. So I wanted to um, focus upon um, one complete project and try to talk about it in a little bit of detail. <clears throat> and this is a work that I made in 1988-89 entitled Monochrome Painting. But this is a view of it um, when it was shown in Art Unlimited at Art Basel maybe two years ago, I think. And this is the most concentrated um, way in which this work has been installed. Because when I started working on this, I thought of it as um, not taking the form of a painting and not taking the form of a series of paintings, but taking the form of a group exhibition. And so, for instance, I thought that when curators um, design group exhibitions, they either start with a group of artists that they're really into, and then they craft maybe some kind of umbrella term that loosely or maybe not so loosely um, unifies the group. Or the um, curator starts with a theme and then tries to search out, either historically diligent or not, uh, works that would serve to illustrate, in the best sense of the term, that thematic. And so I decided that I was going to use the form of the group exhibition, the institutionalized um, group exhibition as the form for this work. So what we're looking at here is um, the, the wall that usually um, confronts the spectator when he or she first um, sees the work. And so I always think of this as the, the museum graphics. This is the museum graphic wall. And so I had designed this um, logo type uh, monochrome painting using a historical typeface cable. Um, and then also using this color, be, which becomes the unif one of the unifying elements of this project. And then um, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, in the frame, is the poster for the exhibition, and it was printed on um, paper stock that was exactly the, this, this color. This color is papyrus green poly. It was um, a color used by Volkswagen Automobile Company in one year, 1985. It's... Um, and it's a metallic automobile paint. But we'll get to that a little bit later. There was also a catalog that was printed for the exhibition that was also printed on um, paper that was this color. And there was a, a, an, uh, an invitation for the exhibition that was also this color. So this is pulling back a little bit. And then there is a series of 14 panels. And just to go back, a little bit of information about this. Um, these panels are um, the supports. This thing is slow. Um, the supports are torsion boxes, so um, that there is um, a hardwood frame. On uh, either side, there's a very thin sheet of Luan or mahogany wood. Uh, the interior uh, of that sandwich is filled with um, a resin impregnated corrugated paper that is used by the aeronautics industry. And then these panels were um, uh, had uh, Belgian linen stretched over them, and they were sized with rabbit skin glue. And then they were taken to an automobile uh, auto body shop, and they were sprayed with this papyrus green poly metallic enamel uh, paint um, that Volkswagen used in 1985. And so 
each panel is exactly the same size as a um, remarkable monochrome painting from the history of modernist painting. And so already, perhaps, well, let me give you the, the, the list of proper names here, if I can remember them. Um, starting on the left, it's uh, Milevich, Rodchenko, Stremensky, Newman, Rauschenberg, Kelly, Klein, Manzoni, Reinhardt, Fontana. We'll come back to this. Um, Marden, Ryman, Richter, and Palermo, as in Blinky, Palermo. And so there are 14 of these panels um, because I decided to lift a structuring device from um, one of these artists' works. So to, just to, to elucidate that is to demonstrate that on one hand, this work is trying to be as homogenous as possible, as even as possible in its application, but there are these exceptions where, for instance, Barnett Newman, for a moment, is privileged because I lifted his... Um, um, the Stations of the Cross as a structuring device that he had used for a series of paintings that he had made in the 60s. Um, I was always curious about Barnett Newman's um, adaptation, even adoption of the Stations of the Cross because he was a Jew. And what's a Jew, Jewish artist doing lifting the Stations of the Cross as a structuring device? One could ask if he was sincere or not. I mean, I always thought of Barnett Newman as being the, um, the quint quintessentially sincere artist. So I had to limit my selection from the canon of monochrome painting um, to 14 artists. And so at one point I, I kept a list of many, many single color uh, paintings and works by different painters some of whom were very much associated with the monochrome, such as Eve Klein, but other artists uh, not so rigidly associated with the monochrome, for instance, Ellsworth Kelly. So um, one thing that might have struck you also is that all of these practitioners are men. Because at one moment I realized that in, in doing my research that, um, yes, I, I, I'm a huge fan, Just I can just put that, my cards on the table, of the work of Marsha Hafif. And at first, I really very much wanted Marsha Hafif to, to have a presence in this work. And then I thought that it would actually be more striking to talk about how history is constructed if Marsha Hafif's name is absent in this project. And actually, the first time that I showed this work in New York, it was at PS1, not in one room such as this. It was in a sequence of three rooms, and, uh, at which point Robert Ryman was privileged because he was the artist who had designed the rooms to begin with and he was the first one to exhibit in these rooms. And then much later on, I got a chance to show there. But across the hall, Marsha Hafif had a retrospective. Of course, I had no knowledge of this when I was working on this work in 1988 because that exhibition only happened in 1990. So I would like to think that there's something structurally... Um, uh, built into this work that even anticipates the occasion when this work could be seen alongside the artist who had been considered but then was eliminated to make a political point. I wanted to go back for a minute. I don't know, you know the, the, the projection isn't so great, but I wanted to give you an idea about what these panels look like. And I never refer to them as paintings because I think of it as being either one big painting that is in 14 panels or the idea that I started with, the idea that it is a group exhibition and it has these um, uh, objects as part of the constitution of that. Um, it was very important. This was, I started thinking about making this work in the mid 80s. And that's when, um, especially in New York, there was a tendency to talk about faux painting or fake painting. And I never understood that argument because, um, 
For instance, there were many artists running to fabric stores at that point, buying a hunk of um, patterned fabric, stretching it and putting it on a wall and maintaining it to a painting, but it was within this, within quotation marks. And I didn't accept the quotation marks. I thought if these artists were going to take the fabric and stretch it and present it in the space of painting, I have no problems um, uh, accepting that as a painting, but then I would have to come to terms with it within the tradition of painting as well. And, you know, it wasn't such, you know, some artists were stretching up fake fur, and I'm thinking, well, you know, the precedent, I think, would be Manzoni for doing that. And I don't think that he was trying to um, present painting uh, a fa the, the idea of the fake painting or suspended painting at all when he stretched up, you know, um, um, a sheepskin with fur. So I, I felt that I had to work a little bit over time to make sure that people would not mistake these for fakes. Um, another way of saying that is that I felt I had to make it an overdetermined point in the project. So that is um, how I came to select Belgian linen, rabbit skin glue, these kinds of supports, um, because they're, they're relatively thin supports, but all of that kind of extra um, muscular architecture that I mentioned about the, the resin impregnated corrugated cardboard in the sandwich was so that they would have a solidity and they wouldn't torque but they could maintain, uh, especially the very large ones, could maintain this slim profile on the wall. So that they would, ha they would activate a certain kind of visual space, but each one would be made exactly the same way. It's just that some of them are this big and some of them are like three by four meters. And I don't know if you can tell the differentiation of the surface, but, um, I, and I don't know how many of you have used rabbit skin glue, but rabbit skin glue, you must work with it when it's warm. It's a very traditional material um, from, uh, from the Renaissance and, and before, actually. Um, but you have to work with it when it's warm. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, most of the applications in classical art were on relatively small panels where one could truly control the properties of rabbit skin glue as a sizing agent. But when you start getting these very, very large panels, it's very difficult to control the consistency um, across the surface. And um, Mark Rothko used rabbit skin glue for, um, for instance, the paintings at the Rothko Chapel in Houston. And there is a lot of incident that is produced through the use of rabbit skin glue in them. And that's one of the things that I was thinking about when I was designing this project. So what happened is that these 14 panels were made, they were stretched, they were sized with rabbit skin glue, we took them to the auto body shop. I'd already made a couple of prototypes because I realized that to, to, to achieve the proper painting surface, they needed to have five very thin coats of automobile lacquer. Um, uh, fewer than that, it would, it, it would not nap the surface of the linen and it would leave holes. More than that, it would have too much of a plastic surface, and I, I wanted to avoid that. So five thin coats allowed the linen to show through, but it was totally napped. But when we were spraying these in um, you know, the Armenian body shop that was next to the apartment I was living in in Hollywood, and we were outdoors spraying these things, especially with the big panels, they looked totally even before we sprayed them. And then as we sprayed them, these huge gestures came up to the surface. And I thought, oh, I've really fucked up. Like something has gone horribly wrong here. I'm going to have to remake these. But then, you know, and I had my nervous breakdown and then I, you know, slept on it. And then the next morning I got up and maybe it's a process of rationalization. Yeah, we never do that in art, do we? But I stopped to go over what was um, a priority for me. And I, I said, well, when, when, as long as I was working on this project, I didn't have a particular image in mind what these paintings or th this, this painting or these panels would look like. I had a very clear idea how they needed to be made. And so actually that very moment when they were sprayed, that's where they were made and that's the first time that I saw them and they were defamiliarized to me immediately. And later I realized that it was kind of important that there was this um, lack of homogeneity in the surface of the paintings. Um, one thing that happens for some in certain conditions upon walking into the exhibition 
of these works, they look like they're heavily impastoed monochromes until you walk up to them and you realize that the paint itself is very, very thin, it's very, very consistent, and something else must be making the incident that all-important word, I think, in the discussion of painting. And you realize that it's actually the sizing agent, the barrier that is separating you know, the poisonous paint from the virginal linen. It's that separating uh, layer that is producing the incident. And I thought that that was um, perhaps a non-trivial point in the project. I don't know if you can tell that there are like these little dots <laughs> to the right of every panel, because every panel had a, um, a plexiglass label that identified uh, it as part of my project. It identified the model painting uh, by the name of the artist, the name of the artwork, the date that the artwork was made, and the materials that that model artwork had been made of. And all of that was screen printed in this uh, papyrus green poly color on the label. So again, it, um, it maintains that kind of hom hom homogeneity. Another limit for this work is that in, uh, among the 14 model paintings, no painting could be made in the same year. They must be presented in chronological order. They could not be the same size. Um, they could not be, there could not be a, a duplication of another artist. Or, or for instance, you couldn't have two Ellsworth Kellys. Um, but there is a certain kind of play that goes on because this painting to the left side is um, a Rauschenberg white painting. And that's what it says on the label, in green, and then the surface of the panel is green. The, um, the painting next to it to the right is an, um, a diptych by Ellsworth Kelly that is yellow, and it's square, but what differentiates the two panels is that one is deeper than the next. But I decided to ignore that formal component. So there's a lot that is uh, willfully ignored in this project, you know, just like history. Okay, now for something new-ish. From 2006 until 2008, I made a series. I'd originally intended it to be uh, five in the series, but now I've limited it to three, and I'll get to that maybe later. Um, this is a work entitled, The Second Sentence of Everything I Read Is You, Morning Sex. Morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, sex. And this is not... Um, an installation view of the first time that it was installed. This is from the Yokohama Triennial in Japan from last September, I think, in 2008. But this is a work that I first made in 2007 in Cologne, Germany at Gallery Gisela Kapitän. And so these works, these second sentence of everything I read is you works, are always particularly cited to a particular room or a gallery, and they take on the characteristics of that room. And then when they are displayed again, nothing is altered from the dimensions of the original room. <clears throat> Time for another anecdote. How many of you are familiar with Lynn Tillman's work? Anybody? Yeah? Um, I'm glad at least one hand went up. Uh, Lynn Tillman is a writer. Um, she writes fiction, she publishes novels, but she also writes about art. Um, she used to write under the moniker Madame Realism as a compliment to surrealism. Um, and I've always maintained that I don't know anything about literature. Um, I wouldn't say that I don't know anything about art or art history, but I, I, I'm, I proudly display my ignorance and, uh, and reassert my ignorance of literature. I take a great deal of pleasure in literature. So one day I was talking to Lynn about writing, and she told me that when she reads, um, she reads the first sentence, and she determines whether it's a strong sentence or not, and oftentimes if it's not a strong sentence, she just puts the book away and she will not even continue. And to, to actually nail her on what the set of criteria is, 
for making that assessment is very, very difficult. But she says this. So I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So then um, every time I would pick up a novel, actually any time I would pick up anything and read the first sentence, then I would think, would this meet Lynn's standards? Would she continue reading or not? And, you know, by extension, should I continue reading? So then a couple of years later, I was uh, in New York and we were, go you know, going to galleries together. And I told her that, you know, she's altered my reading experience. And I said, the second text of everything I read is you. No, the second sentence of every text I read is you. And she said, you know, being the inveterate editor that she is, she said, no, 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 it shouldn't be text. It should be the second sentence of everything, everything I read is you. And I said, I say, you know, I, I, I appreciated that and I accepted the editing. And then I decided to co-opt the, the uh, or it's kind of like co-opting my own phrase back from her after she had edited it as the um, title of this work. So this series of three works, on one level, was determined by um, Floor Carpet Company. Do you know F-L-O-R, Carpet Company? Is that available in Norway? It's a big hit in the States. It's kind of like Euro carpeting, and it's, um, it, it's, it comes in carpet tiles and all different colors and different shapes. It's kind of revolutionized the way in which people can carpet their own apartments in New York, for instance because you can do it yourself, and it, you took, they just come in boxes. So um, I was looking through their catalog one day, and they had um, a series called, I think it's called Walk in the Clouds, and it was a whole series of like low pile, um, very dense carpeting, and many of the colors were pastels. And... Um, I thought, well, this is interesting. I, I haven't really used pastel colors in my work, and I've been trying to work on my deficiencies as a colorist since I f saw my first survey exhibition in 1992, and I thought I could do better. And so I decided that, you know, there were five pastels at that time. There was Ballet Slipper Pink. This is Baby Blue Eyes. There's Buttercup Yellow. There was... Um, Mermaid Green, and then there was Periwinkle Pony, which is lavender in a, another parlance. But I had to truncate my series because um, Floor Corporation has discontinued Periwinkle Pony and this kind of uh, Mermaid Green. So I've just decided to accept their kind of pastel version um, of the primary colors pink, baby blue, and light yellow. So this is the second of that series. Um, when I make these works, I always carpet the entire room, except for the space beneath the shipping crates. And all the components for this work collapse down and can fit into these crates. Um, the cushions that are on top go into the crates. Um, that's a loudspeaker uh, grid in the back. Uh, that's a light box with a photo image on it um, to the right. Um, the, there is a painting that hangs from the ceiling on a window blind. Um, so one of the things I thought of was that this is kind of like a, a traveling circus, or it's the idea of the international exhibition, and you're working on that, right, as a symposium for like the Biennale, the Triennale, the Quadrennial on and on. Um, the idea of these artworks that get packed up and then they kind of move all over the place. They can seamlessly move in and out of a variety of different contexts. It's the, the trade of um, the biennial artist, I guess. And I wanted to make an artwork in some respects that um, tried to give form to some of those conditions. Uh, two of the walls in the gallery are always painted. There's always a textual frieze uh, at the top um, that runs along those two walls. There is always a this painting component that I mentioned. It's that kind of whitish element um, that is hanging from the ceiling next to that spotlight. The spotlight is part of the work also. It collapses down, goes back into its box, and goes into a crate. Um, 
there's always a sound component and um this shows you a little bit more of it um the freeze on this um for this particular work says things felix forgot to tell us and so in some respects that operates as a kind of umbrella statement for the work and here you can see the painting kind of blowing in the breeze because the air circulation system in this at the Yokohama Triennial was fierce. It was like a cyclone. And so the painting was just like flopping all over the place, but I kind of liked that. It made people think, and it was very near the sea, you know, so it brought the naval theme out a little bit. Um, so this gives you a little bit idea of an idea of the um, what some of the interiors of the crates look like when the work is on display because um, oh you can see the arrow okay great these are the sides of the crates that have been taken off and then they lean against the the crates and you can't see it probably at all but the title of the work um, the materials of the work are stenciled in baby blue on the side of the crate um, then there's also a list of all the people that assisted me in making this, like the sound engineer that helps me record the music, blah, 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 uh, the people who make the crates. Uh, then there is a special thanks section. And I thank, every time I do one of these works, I thank Lynn Tillman, because she operated as a point of inspiration for the title. But then um, all of the, 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 the people who have written text that I use as lyrics for a song that I write and perform in the space are thanked. And for this particular installment, um, I decided that all the lyrics for the song I would write would be restricted to the Felix Gonzalez Torres book that Julie Alt edited a couple of years ago. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. It's a fantastic book, a true labor of love that Julie made for her dear friend Felix. But, um, but of course, it's more than a sentimental object. It's a testament in the best sense of that term. So. Um, in fact, I decided to use this book for all the lyrics that I would sing before the book was published, before I saw a copy, before I ever read it. So I decided that that was one of the limits that I was going to impose upon myself, that I would have to try to find a way to sing. So um, there is this grid of eight speakers, and then there is the errant ninth one, always somewhere else, located elsewhere in the space. Um, there are two musical compositions that I would write. One would be um, an instrumental, and one would be a pop song about love, sex, and death, even though I understand that that's a, contra uh, 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 a redundancy because all pop songs are about love, sex, and death. But the, each, one, each composition is about three minutes long, and the first one is an instrumental, and I use this very guitar that is by my side here to um, write a, an, an eight-track guitar uh, instrumental that usually would um, uh, embrace the structure of the drone in some way, and a different guitar part would come out of each speaker. And then when it shifts to the pop song, the voice comes from this, or the, the, the lead voice comes from this solo, isolated speaker in a spotlight on the other side of the room, and all eight speakers for guitar becomes the accompaniment for it. Um, but gradually, as this three-minute pop song progresses, the guitars drop out and are replaced by voices, and it ends with a nine-voice chord. Thank you. Thank you.